On today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, we'll be finishing up the 101 Coaching Mistakes to Avoid by Thomas Leonard. Let's go. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hey there, welcome back to the uh, to the podcast today. We're going to be finishing up, and I have to admit, I feel a little, you know, verklempt about it. We're finishing up the 101 Coaching Mistakes to Avoid by the late, great Thomas Leonard, as you've been probably uh, aware by now. <laughs> we've been going through this 10 at a time for the past, uh, I don't know, a couple months or so. So here we are with the last 11. Now this is the one goes to 11. This is the best one of all. It doesn't just go to 10. Yes. And so uh, with no further ado, I would just like to say, uh, let's go. Coaching mistake number 91 is being heavy or significant. Now, some of us can't help, you know, being heavy or significant. But, but I'm kidding. But seriously now, folks, the, um, the, uh, the mistake of being heavy or significant, Thomas Wright, writes this. He says, the best coaches I know are light and casual and don't get wrapped up into the coaching thing. He says, true. Clients are working on some very important stuff, and the coach is respectful slash caring. But at the same time, life is unpredictable, and we humans are funny, and problems are solvable. Let me just read that last line again. Life is unpredictable. We humans are funny, and life uh, life's problems are solvable. Life problems are solvable. That's what it comes down to. Problems are solvable. And when things happen, you know, we have to make sure that we stay resourceful. If we get caught up in it too much, there's an expression of it having you or you having it. I had a therapist once who liked to use that expression. He said, you know, uh, part of he did Jungian psychotherapy, Jungian psychology. Um, He said part of Jung's whole thing was, you know, yeah, you've got a neurosis. Yeah, you've got this mother complex. Yeah, you've got this. Yeah, you've got that. But you've got it. Question is, does it have you? So when something flares up and you are in the throes of it and you are just overwhelmed by it, it has you. So, yes, we can accept that I have that. I have this challenge, this thing. But if as long as I'm going like I have it, then I can find a solution. I can find a workaround or I can find a remedy or I can find something to fix it and find a solution to that problem. So yeah, things are are heavy. Things are, life is hard sometimes. It really is. And the more that we can sort of, you know, be resourceful and light and and, and casual about it, um, the better. John, John, uh, John Lavelle, my co-trainer for a while back in the nineties for NLP trainings, who works with Richard Bandler now, he, um, he always used to say, you know, if you can laugh at your problem, then, then you can solve it. You know, it doesn't have you anymore. You have it. It's basically saying the same thing. Being able to laugh at your problem gives you power. So do that instead of being heavy or significant, which would be a mistake. In fact, it would be coaching mistake number 91 to avoid. Coaching mistake number 92, coaching mistake to avoid number 92 is selling clients on your goals now, this one I, I can resonate with. I, I've seen people do this. It drives me a little crazy, honestly. He writes, Thomas Leonard writes, sometimes you can see a better goal for the client than they have for themselves. It's tricky to know whether they to suggest or slash push for yours or help them reach theirs. When in doubt, ask the client to choose. If you, you're inappropriately selling, if you find yourself, one, trying to convince the client to go in your direction, Two, getting upset because the client doesn't get it. Or three, taking their choice to taking their choice to ignore your goal personally. Taking their choice to ignore your goal personally. 
So here's the thing. You are a servant. I know, I know, I know. We we think of ourselves sometimes as being uh, pretty smart because we've done a lot of studying. We know a lot of things. We've been around the block a few times. It's all true. And yet your job here is a, is a delicate one. Your job is a servant. You are not, you don't know. You don't know what's right for your client. You don't know what's best for them. You have an inkling. You've got a pretty good idea, probably, and maybe you're right. Probably you are. And ultimately, it's not your choice. Ultimately, it's not your choice. They they have hired you to help them get their goals. And I have found myself in this situation many times where, you know, what the client wants and what the client needs may be two very different things. And I feel that in a way that they may not be conscious of it, but they have chosen me as their coach because I'm able to see those things. And it would be wrong of me not to, you know, work towards what they need as well as what they want. I need to do both. I, that's my feeling about it. I, I feel like I need to do both. And it's a delicate thing because sometimes if you bring it to their conscious attention, it becomes more of a, I don't know, less likely that they'll get it. You know, um, doesn't mean you shouldn't. Just means that um, it's a delicate thing. Sometimes I work towards those things sort of more obliquely. In the Ericksonian world, you might say, you know, indirectly, indirect suggestions, indirect stories. So that's where storytelling comes in a lot. You know, where I tell stories, you know, that reminds me of a story. I'm thinking of a personal direct client right now. I won't tell the story about this particular client because I, I don't know if he or she ever listens in. But it is a situation that... Um, It'd be, it'd be a perfect story to tell you right now, let me just say, because they had this experience that they approached in a certain way and they wanted to help to, you know, do it better. And I'm going like, well, that's not so good, <laughs> but I did it. I helped them to do it better. And then I also said, you know, it's also possible that, you know, and I told a story to this client about um, il illustrating what I thought they needed perhaps to uh, learn from this experience that they're having and that they, this is an opportunity for, for growth in a way that they hadn't recognized, you know, uh, or perhaps we're not recognizing, but it's not really my job to make them do that. I can offer it to them. I can do my best to suggest that they go that way. Ultimately it's their choice and I have to abide uh, the dude has to abide there. Yeah. So mistake number 10, 92 is to sell clients on your goals. Coaching mistake to avoid number 93. Coaching someone you don't enjoy. Thomas writes, either let the client go, discuss with the client what is annoying you, or find a way to truly enjoy the client. Otherwise, your coaching will be tainted and less valuable. And Life is too short to coach people who you don't enjoy. That kind of says it all, don't you think? I don't really have to comment too much there. Um, fire your clients if they're not working out for you. If it's, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there. There's other people that they can pick. There's other people they can go to. If you're just really not, and you know, you know, if, you, if you're looking to this, I think this has been stated in some previous episodes, um, other mistakes that kind of overlapped a bit. But it's okay to trust your instincts. And if you're really just not having a good time, even if you need the money, let go of that client. It's, it's not serving you. And you are just as important as they are. You are. You're just as important as they are. And yes, they need you maybe more than they think they do. <laughs> but, but, uh, but if you're really just, if, they, if your body is telling you a response. I, I had a client once. Who I, and I'll, I'll be very blunt about this. Um, it came to pass that I, I developed this kind of um, gut feeling, this this really unpleasant gut feeling that whenever um, this coaching call started, I, I would I would have moments of dread before it started, and this kind of like bad feeling in my tummy when it did start, you know. And I finally listened to that, and um, I just had a conversation with her. It was a her. And, um, and I said, listen, I, I think this isn't working for me. And um, 
I would like to suggest that there's some better people that would be a better fit, not necessarily better coaches than I am. I don't want to say that, but a better fit. That happens, doesn't it? People are just better fits. So go with that. Go with that. Life really is too short to uh, coach people you don't enjoy. Coaching mistake number 94, being a positive Pamela. Yes, that's what it says, being a positive Pamela. I don't know that expression either. But here's what Thomas writes. He said, some coaches force clients to interpret and or describe their situation only in a positive way. It's not a problem, merely a challenge. Oh, it's not you. It's just a limiting belief that you have. Oh, you shouldn't use the word should. What's the positive that will come from this? The problem with this approach is that they don't honor the client's feelings and, in fact, cannot bear to even have a whiff of perceived negativity nearby. This is a common problem with emotionally rigid or healing coaches where language protects the heart instead of releasing the truth. Positive Pamela. Yeah, I don't know the expression positive Pamela, but I've certainly seen this before. And and it's funny because I've been talking for whatever reason a lot about this with some of my coaching clients recently, that it's good to know what you don't want. It's good to say, I don't like that. It's good to say, I don't want that. It's good to say, that's not for me. Or that's, you know, it's good to have that sort of understanding. And pain, as an example, can be a really good thing. Pain is a teacher, isn't it? Pain is a signal from our unconscious mind that says, hey, don't do that anymore. Get your hand off that hot stove. Move away from there. Do something different. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we recognize that the negative isn't negative. I mean, I'm trying not to be a positive Pamela here. But the negative isn't negative. It's a signal. The negative isn't, quote, negative. It's something that, you know, we should be aware of. Right? You need to be aware of those things and just to allow it in. Stephen Gilligan often says, you know, welcome, you know, to those parts of those things that are happening that, that are painful, that are negative, quote unquote. So I will often tell people there's no such thing as a negative emotion. I believe that is true. Emotions are classified by us as being negative sometimes, but all emotions are signals. All emotions are your unconscious mind telling you something. They might be telling you something great. I love this. This is great. I feel so happy. Or they might be telling you something like, oh, this is not good for me. You know, that person I don't enjoy, I'm going to stop coaching them, you know, it can be telling you some really positive things through the negative. So it doesn't always have to be positive, right? It doesn't have to be like, oh, well, that's a good thing. Let's let's look at the bright side of this. You know, you don't have to be that um, that person. Now, I will also say this. I, I once enjoyed a lecture, talk, a presentation, um, by Marion Williamson. I used to love going to her lectures, her talks about the, uh, uh, what's it called? The, um, uh, gosh, <laughs> it comes to me in just a moment. A little brain fart here, but uh, Marion Williamson used to teach on the Course in Miracles. That's what it was. And um, she was saying that, that um, not positive Pamela, not goody two shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, somebody who was in a movie. There's a movie made about once, um, uh, a Disney movie, probably. Pollyanna, Pollyanna. Pollyanna was a movie with Haley Mills back in the 1960s. It's probably a book before that. But it's about this little girl. I, I think she might be orphaned or something. And she goes to live with her uncle that she never knew and he had lost his wife and has lived in this big Victorian house in this town that she didn't know anybody and the big Victorian house was all closed up and dark and she wasn't allowed to sing or whistle or dance or anything um, but she remained positive she remained positive all the time and it eventually before the movie was over um, everyone in town just loved her and, and, the, and the 
her uncle had opened up all the windows of the house and, and was happy again and everything was beautiful and light. And Marion Williams said, Williamson said that, um, you know, people say, oh, you're just being Pollyanna about that, or you know, to use um, Thomas Leonard's, you know, here, the positive, you're just being a positive family. But being a Pollyanna, she said, gets a bad rap, because look at what the this little girl did. You know, here she comes in, she's like 10 years old, and this whole town is sour and rule, rule bound, and, and, and she turns the whole place around. She, that's power. Right, that's power to turn the whole place around. So, you know, don't be don't be a too much of a everything's fine, positive Pamela thing. But um, anyway, you know what I'm saying, right? Being being that pers- person who can can see the positive in things and say yes, it is negative. Yes, it's painful. And what's the message here? And where how can we go from here? Is a really powerful thing. So. Coaching mistake number 95. Next one. Assuming your client got the point. That's a mistake. It's coaching mistake number 95. Assuming the client got your point. Thomas writes, points take time to sink in and be understood. When making an important life coaching point, life changing point, take the time to find out exactly what the client heard and how fully they've integrated it. Due to filters and biases, most clients mishear big points or only hear a part of what you've been. So repeat, rephrase, give examples, discuss the nuances of your key points, take the necessary time to ensure complete understanding. Now, Thomas was great at this. I remember during the trainings that I had with Thomas back in the 90s, you know, he would do exactly that. He would, he had big points to make, you know, so if we go back to coaching mistake, was it 91, um, about 90, about no, 91 being heavy or significant, he could sometimes be pretty darn heavy, I have to say, and, and significant. He, he, he could do that, but I guess not too much. He was always light and stuff, but he would make sure you got the point. He would repeat things. He'd rephrase them, give examples over and over again, discuss the nuances and ask questions until he was pretty certain you got it. So that's what I do. And that's what I'm sure many of you do as well, just to make sure they got it. And don't just say it and think that's done, you know, move on. Okay, we got that. Let's move on. You know, take your time. Take your time. Coaching is a beautiful thing in that it is not, you know, a one-shot deal. You you get more time with a person. You can have conversations with people. You can talk about this next week again and, and have it settle in even more. You know, one of the things in my business in my career as being a hypnotherapist, as being a NLP practitioner, is that a lot of times people expect it to be a one-stop shopping, you know, just just pop in and in a half an hour, we'll have you fixed, you know, have that phobia gone and everything's okay. And, and it's been sold that way. And a lot of times it is that way. It doesn't have to be, however, and sometimes it really is a disservice to your clients to you know, go along with that expectation. You know, people are complicated and you make one change and other things will change down the road. So it really is a good idea, no matter what your profession is, to let things settle, to take some time, have it certainly be more than one session. But coaching is great because it's usually, you know, my minimum is three hours, three months of coaching. And so um, I, I heartily recommend that sort of thing. You know, have a minimum like that so you can take the time to make sure they got your point and that they got the point and integrate it and make changes in their lives based on it. Don't assume. Coaching mistake number 96, coaching the wrong clients for you. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? Coaching the wrong clients for you. You will feel invalidated and frustrated if you are coaching clients who cannot benefit fully from your experience, your expertise, or your style. The clients will feel similarly. It's your responsibility, not the client's, to coach the type of clients who bring out your best and who you can help. Always have 20 or 30 other coaches to refer people to who you don't feel you can do a terrific job for. Now, I do not have 30 other coaches to refer people to. I I don't know if I have 20 other coaches to refer people to, but I certainly have more than 10. I've got a a bunch of people that I can refer people to, and I do. Because why? 
I maybe because I do this podcast for a variety of reasons. I get a lot of requests for coaching. I do not accept them all. I actually have a fairly small uh, cohort, um, posse. I don't know what the word is, number of people that I work with at a given time. It's It hovers around 12. I, I, I just don't have that much time in my week. I'm doing other things, teaching, recording podcasts, et cetera. So um, I, I say no as often as I say yes to people. And then when I say no, I think, I basically say to the person, and I think this other person would be perfect for you, listening to what I've heard you say about what you're going for and what your needs are. I think, wow, this person would be great for you. And I'll give a couple reasons, you know, maybe this other person's female and so is the client and whatever. So we say, well, this would be a better fit for you in this particular situation to work with a, a female coach or or whatever any number of reasons but i will give them reasons not just because i don't like you and don't think we'll fit but because i think it'll be better for you to work with this other person so don't coach the wrong clients for you and just like it said in coaching mistake number 91 uh no i'm sorry 93 coaching people you don't enjoy Eh, a little redundant but that's okay Coaching mistake number 97, being rigid in your advice or approach. Can you feel the excitement? 97, that's 98, 99, 100. And then what could possibly be saved for 101? It's almost like, you know, when you write an advertising letter, sometimes that PS at the bottom of the letter is the most important thing (laughs) for a letter because they go, oh, PS, what's down there? Sometimes people ignore most of what's in the letter and they go right to the PS. So maybe that's going to be true for 101 too. I know I'm excited. But right now, coaching mistake number 97 says, being rigid in your advice slash approach. Thomas writes this. He says, rigid coaches see things in terms of right or wrong, good or bad, smart or dumb, suitable or unsuitable. They are often stuck in narrow beliefs and are often fearful of risk or consequences. They would rather impose their opinions on the client about how to, about how life or business success works than in co-creating new, clever, customized strategies with the client. You know you're a rigid coach if you aren't learning as much from your clients as you teach. That is a good barometer of whether you're being rigid in your advice. I, I have known coaches, I don't refer people to them, but I know coaches who have a sequence. They have a program that they put people through. They have their coaching process that they put everybody through. I don't think that's what uh, this is about. I think people are, everyone is an individual. And your job as a coach is to help this person become their best self. Uh, As I've mentioned in past podcasts, I believe, you know, uh, Carl Jung and Jungian psychology was about individualiz- individuation, individuation, so that that person becomes the best them, the person they are meant to be on the planet. That's that's what the the goal of therapy is, not to overcome neuroses or psycho. You know, yeah, that too. But you're not there to fix somebody. You help them to discover who they are. And to bring that out so they can fully embrace that. We've talked about this before where, you know, the the idea of following your bliss. Somebody said that's bad advice. I don't think it's bad advice at all. I think it's excellent advice. You just have to recognize that it might not pay very well. Um, You know, if if you want to really be that, you know, mitten knitter or whatever, that's where you find your bliss is knitting mittens. But, you know, maybe... Maybe it will. Um, So, you know, Bernie Sanders, mitten knitter, did pretty well. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, don't be rigid in your advice or your approach. You you want to be fluid. You want to be flexible. You want to be co-creating new, clever, customized strategies with the client. This is a game that we are playing as a coach together with our co-players. Remember Dave Buck's first original advice? This is that we are co-creating and never, never, never be rigid. There's always different for everybody. It's always a new 
path because it's a new person starting in a different place and then going in a different direction. All right, coaching mistake number 98. I feel like a distant drum roll happening. Um, putting, wait a minute, a positive spin on everything. What, 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 this is totally done. Thomas, Thomas, you're being lazy here. Pa- pa- Pamela, positive Pamela was just a few ago. She was 94. Okay. I'm sorry. I, for Thomas, I'm sorry. So maybe maybe there's more into this. Let's read it and find out. Mistake number 98, putting a positive spin on everything. Being positive is great, but some coaches feel compelled to make the problems that clients are dealing with less serious or negative. Oh, that's not that bad. Oh, you will work it out. It's just a temporary situation. You are doing your best. The above may be true, but it's usually better to be frank and honest first and then be positive about a solution instead of falsely positive about the situation. Sometimes situations just suck. Yeah. Okay. I get that. And that's absolutely right. I just don't need to say anything more about that. Um, Don't do that. (laughs) I'll repeat the last paragraph because that's, that sells it for me. It says the above may be true, but it's usually better to be frank and honest first and then be positive about a solution instead of falsely positive about the situation. Sometimes situations just suck. That says it. Okay. Mistake number 99, being complacent. Coaching skills, techniques, and technologies are evolving very, very quickly. The marketplace is demanding currently trained coaches who are specialists. Some coaches don't see the need to continually learn what's new in our business. This can put them behind the effectiveness curve and diminishes the reputation in the coaching community. So don't be complacent. Part of the reason I started this podcast, the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, and part of the reason I started my Essential Coaching Skills website, where you can learn things like NLP, hypnosis, sleight of mouth, is because we are always needing to hone our skills. Sometimes we need to go back and refine our skills, just like a a basketball player or a golfer or whatever needs to go back. I remember a famous story about Jack Nicklaus, the the perhaps greatest golfer of all time. He certainly has won more majors than anybody else, including Tiger Woods. And at the moment, it's looking like record safe. We don't know. But Jack, every year, His teacher was a guy named Jack Grout, if I remember correctly. Every year throughout his professional career, at the beginning of the season, Jack would return to his hometown of wherever it was, Ohio, I'm pretty sure, and and go back to his teacher and say, Jack, Jack Grout in this case, I'm a beginner. Teach me how to play golf. And he would go back and he'd learn, like, how do you hold a club? How do you swing? And now he's probably a pretty quick learner. But nevertheless, he went back to the basics and really honed and practiced those fundamentals. The fundamentals you do need review and honing, et cetera. And at the same time, things change, things evolve. If Jack Nicholas was playing with the same set of clubs that he had in 1960 when he burst onto the scene with Arnold Palmer, he would not have done very well in the 80s. Because, you know, club, clubs had changed and et cetera. Like things had changed. Got a lot bigger club heads, bigger, faster, longer drives are possible. So everyone needs to evolve and, 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 you know, continue to find what's the latest currently evolving thing. You have to. You just You just simply have to. So don't be complacent. That would be a mistake. In fact, that's a coaching mistake. Number 99, coaching mistake 100 is is exhorting your clients to change. Exhorting means to encourage with pressure. It's tempting when you see a better way for the client to live or succeed. Now, better is in quotes here. I didn't, I I, I tried to make it obvious with my voice, but you probably missed it. So I'm just going to read that bit that Thomas wrote again. He said, exhorting means to, quote, encourage with pressure, end quote. And it's tempting when you can see a, quote, better, end quote, way for the client to live or succeed. Remember, clients choose to change exactly when they are ready to. And while exhorting can and does work, the psychic time and emotional cost to the coach is high, and an adversarial relationship can be created. 
plant seeds, encourage readily, don't exhort. Yes. So any questions? <laughs> that's, that's coaching mistake number 100. Don't exhort your clients to change. Don't push them. Nudge. Nudge. Um, Milton Erickson was, was probably the master of this. Milton Erickson, you know, the guy that is, didn't, didn't invent Ericksonian hypnosis. He just did hypnosis in his way. And after he was gone, people started calling it Ericksonian hypnosis, but he's who I'm talking about, Milton Erickson, Ericksonian hypnosis. He was very often quite indirect in his approach to change you know he would he would tell stories he would suggest things and say i wonder how that's going to work out for you maybe it might be like this and he, he talks in these ways that would be planting seeds and and encouraging but not exhorting you know you can't push the river you can't push the river don't don't try just let it go just encourage as, as they go along okay drum roll <laughs> Coaching mistake 101. Here it is. Maybe, maybe, like the PS, maybe the most important thing of all. I don't know. We'll find out. But here it is. Coaching mistake you've all been waiting for. Number 101 is not being you. At some point, you will find your professional voice and your coaching will be completely yours, not anyone else's. You find your voice after about 100 clients. It's beneficial to learn, practice, and master the official phrasing programs, coaching skills, and strategies. But at some point, you'll put your twist onto what you've learned and making it, make it an expression of you and what you know works. Now, that, that's, that statement of being you, yeah, that's exactly correct. Um, that's how you become successful ultimately is that you are you. Nobody else can be you. So nobody else can do what you do and say, I can do the same thing, but cheaper. No, they can't. <laughs> really, truly cannot. You're the only one that can do that, which is a great thing. So your coaching practice will really take off when it gets to that point. Don't rush it, however. It will be one of those things like those seeds in Coaching Mistake 100 that get planted. It will evolve. It will grow. It will come when it's ready. You know, the plant will come poke its head out. There's a, a famous true uh, example of this. It's just, not just a metaphor. I believe it's, it's real. Um, uh, uh, I never actually fact-checked it, but you can. It's about um, bamboo, a certain species of bamboo that you plant the seeds and nothing happens above the ground. A lot happens below the ground. The seeds take root and they spread this root system out for maybe many yards, you know, big, big patch of these roots. But again, you don't see anything above the ground, but these roots are really being active. And then one day, for some reason, and by the way, you don't want to be napping on a cot above the bamboo when it happens. Someday at some point they go, go, and everybody's sprouts up above the, the the land and it grows up like 30 feet. The bamboo grows up in 30 feet in in a day. Probably not in minutes out Jack and the Beanstalk. This is reality, folks. Um but it's amazingly fast. You can you can see it happening. If you if you're patient you sit back you can watch it growing. But like in a day you got like 30 foot bamboo up there. And so like there's this wall of bamboo that you know that wasn't there the day before. Sometimes change is like that. It takes time. And a lot of it is going on beneath the surface. You're learning a lot. I'll tell you another true story. And this one I know for a fact to be true. Frank Fairley, who is the uh, creator of provocative therapy, Nick Kemp, who has been a guest on this podcast before, um, who does provocative change works, was a big advocate and student of him. Frank Fairley's brought him to England to teach a lot. Um, I brought Frank Fairley to New York. There's videos on this Essential Coaching Skills website that you can get of watching Frank in action. Frank is a unique person who would be like telling jokes and changing the subject and blaming the, the, 
the lamp was too bright for the problems that you have. Ah, oh, that's not it's not a psychosis. It's the lamp's too bright. See, what you got to do is you get dimmer. <laughs> you tell these ridiculous stories. But this unique way of 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 working with people came out of his many years of working with Rogerian therapy. Rogerian therapy. I don't know if you Carl Rogers. Rogerian therapy was, was it's the most gentle therapy form you can imagine. Carl was, you know, probably somewhat like Mr. Rogers from the TV fame, but I never met Carl Rogers. Um, what he would do in Ro- what became known as Rogerian therapy is he would simply repeat back to the person what they had just said, but ask it as a question. So he, you, you're saying he would repeat back exactly what the person just said, but phrase it as a question? Yes, he would repeat back exactly what the person said, but he'd rephrase it as a question. Wow, that's really interesting. Then what? Well, then, you know, so that's what he did. That was Rogerian therapy. Frank Fairley was a Rogerian therapist and was doing that. You mean Frank Fairley was a Rogerian therapist and he was repeating everything, just asking it as a question? Yes, Frank Fairley did that. And then one day he noticed it wasn't working and he was like frustrated with it. So he said, oh, let's do this. And he broke out of that. And suddenly like bamboo growing up overnight, he became a provocative therapist and never looked back. And, you know, and it was <laughs> night and day. It was completely different. And that's a beautiful story, but you don't want to start there. You let it evolve. You, as I'm going to repeat this again, Thomas would say, it's beneficial to learn, practice, and master the official phrasing programs, coaching skills, and strategies. But at some point, you will put your twist to what you've learned and you will make it an expression of you and what you know works. So it would be a mistake to do otherwise. It would be a mistake to not be you. And that is coaching mistake number 101. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I certainly have. It's been enlightening to me because I learned these a long time ago. So it's great to go back to those basics. Jack, I'm a beginner. Teach me how to play golf. Go back to those basics and learn this. I got these once again from Thomas Leonard back a long time ago, but you can get them too. You can go to coachville.com, www.coachville.com. And I believe, pretty sure, haven't looked lately, but I believe they're still there. Why wouldn't they be? They're great. They're timeless. And uh, I believe you can sign up for something and get that and a whole bunch of other wonderful materials from Coach Phil, which is the organization that Thomas Leonard started and is now, I'm pretty certain about this, run by Dave Buck, a great coach, Coach Dave. So do that if you want to, coachville.com, great resource for us all. And thank you very much for listening. This has been a joy. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart.